All right, we're on. Okay, welcome everybody. <sighs> Nobody froze to death. Oh, on the way here. Oh, let me plug my computer in so it doesn't run out of. Oh, it's awful. It's awful out. Um, I do not think that you guys owe me a paper, right? Oh, you do owe me a paper. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm confusing you with the high school. That's what happens when I do all the homework at once. Hey, could a couple of people who are relatively tall come and clip this map to the, to the thing for me? Or, or you can do it. You can do it. Grab the clips, and then I'll hold one in. And if you would just clip it up there, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, must be nice. Must be nice. Okay, so go ahead. I'm sorry, and Bailey just gave me her paper. Go ahead and give me get your papers out, and I will come collect your papers. And I'm curious who wants to live in the Middle Ages and who doesn't. I feel like it was the vote was heavy for no. <laughs> I feel like my vote would be no. I watched a movie with my husband last night that. It was about people living in the future. Anybody have a paper? Uh, oh, okay. um, and everybody's really stupid in the future, and they end up being the smartest people. They were really average, but now they're the smartest people on earth. So, I, okay. It, <laughs> the language was a little rough. I will just say that it's probably not for consumption of this crowd, but it, um, it was called Idiocracy. And <laughs> And it, it was the stupidest movie, but it made me laugh out loud, so I guess that's job done. Anyway, so you guys will not turn into that, but he was trying to convince people that, you know, that once upon a time people read because, be, because there were things in books, and in the future they have decided sports drinks are really good, so they should water everything with sports drinks, and so they water their crops with sports drinks, but of course the crops don't grow, and they don't know why. I don't, well, those people were lazy, right? Those people were lazy, and these people are stupid, and kind of gives you a warning about the future. Which is only a step away from putting people in front of computers, but I will not. I will not go there. Okay. I brought in... Why don't you go ahead and get your reading questions out? You had not very many this week. And... Um, I brought in a bunch more art. I am not going to make you stare at art for a minute. Oh, but Isabella took me up on the challenge. And would you like to show people the original? Would you, do you mind t showing it to all the tables? Yes, you should show the original. Here, my, com my camera's a little crooked. And I brought the lady with the ermine, but I forgot to dig out my daughter's copy of it. So I'll have to. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I gave you a picture of you for your appreciation. But, you know, maybe, no offense to Isabella, but I think Isabella would agree, maybe Isabella did not make a masterpiece, but you can bet Isabella knows that picture now. She really knows how that picture is laid out, and, and, and the elements of it and the colors and she's thought about the proportions. Um, there's just, sometimes there's no substitute for trying it. And I know some of us, we don't like to do things if we don't think we're gonna be good at it, you know? But try it anyway, all right? Okay, so what I wanna do is go through, Dorothy Mills mentioned in this week's reading a lot of artists and I just felt, I don't expect you to remember all these artists, and I don't expect you to remember all the artwork that I brought in, but I just thought it might be nice to put some pieces of artwork with the names in the book so that it has a connection. Some of them you probably are familiar with. I'm assuming everybody's heard of Leonardo da Vinci. And everybody knows that Michelangelo, and everybody knows that Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling and knows something about him. But if you don't, it's, it's fine. That now you get to find out, and that's awesome. But, um, but anyway, but I brought in some artwork uh, of all these people, 
And I wanted to look at what she says about a few of them. Um, she quotes, she being Dorothy Mills, she quotes a biographer named Vasari. And did you notice there were long excerpts out of a, out of a book about these artists? You know, it's, it's indented and the print's a little smaller. And this man named Vasari, he lived in, in the 16th century. He was a contemporary of da Vinci and these people. So he, when he tells stories, we, they're pretty accurate. You know, he's not doing research in the past. He can talk to people who know them. And he just did this massive biography called Lives of the Artists. And he talks about the lives of some of these people. And I thought that this uh, first uh, description was really interesting. This is the guy whose name that I'm not totally sure how, whether I should pronounce it Simabue or Chimabue, but I know the bue part. <laughs> sure about the Sima or the Chima. And this is um, this is a a close up of a painting of the crucifixion. All right, the painting is the whole crucifixion. Do you understand? And this is a close up at Jesus's face. This is Chimabue. And, and you can see, because he's fairly early, he's sort of transitional, you can see the eyes of Jesus are very sort of elongated and almond-shaped in a very Byzantine way, like the Byzantine art we looked at. But, but he's got expression. Somebody yesterday said he looks relaxed or something. I just, it, this is, it's done. It is, it is finished, is what this makes me think. It is finished. And so I wish I had a, a whole, the whole one to bring to you. This is Chimabue. He's starting to put detail. Look at, look at Jesus' ribs. Look at his chest. Put the detail in. That this is what a human person looks like. And Vasari, the biographer, says this about him. Instead of paying attention to his lessons, uh, Chimabue spent the whole day in drawing men, horses, houses, and various other fancies on his books and odd sheets, like, the one, like one who felt himself compelled to do so by nature. And so his parents, seeing that he spent all his time drawing, I'm not telling you to ignore your studies and just spend all your time drawing. You should, you should do your studies. But sometimes when we have a calling, do you know when, when we've been gifted by God for something, it just bubbles out. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's what you love to do. And what you love to do may be an indication of what God has called you to do. Although, if you love to play video, I don't know. If you're going to design the great, I don't, I don't know. There's probably limits to that. So they, they apprenticed him. And by the way, uh, Dorothy Mills said, this, this was in the reading you did last week, artists painted in schools. And by schools, I mean two things. Schools mean a, a tradition um, of a style of art. But I mean literal schools. So um, let's say Simeon is the, the greatest artist in the world. Congratulations. And so we all want to paint like him. And these are my daughters here. They're all gifted. <laughs> and I just, I send them to Simeon School to be apprenticed. They don't go to college. They don't go to art school. They go to Simeon. And just like you would apprentice to become a blacksmith or a silversmith or something like that. You apprentice. And so they basically spend oodles of time doing what Isabella did this week. They copy pictures. We think of copying as being low class, kind of. You know what I mean? We're supposed to be original. We're supposed to do our own thing. The people who painted these masterpieces started out copying to get good. And so, you know, eventually, eventually Lauren is good enough that, that Simeon says, hey, you want to you want to do this flower in the corner of my painting I'm doing? She's like, yeah, I'll do the flower. 
So she does the flower. He goes, oh, it's a pretty good flower. And then she gets bumped up the ranks. Maybe eventually, um, it was Raphael, another artist we're going to look at. He was apprenticed, and they let him do an angel in the corner of the painting. And then people came and were like, oh, that's pretty good. But that angel is <laughs> fabulous. And that's when his, his employer, his, the person to whom he was apprenticed, knew he was brilliant. His painting was better than the master's. So they would apprentice. So his, so his parents sent him to be apprenticed, okay? And it says, listen to this. Then by dint of continual practice and with the assistance of his natural talent, he far surpassed the manner of his teachers. What made him good? By dint of continual practice practice with the assistance of natural talent. What makes us good at something? Practice. I know. We, we don't like to hear it. I don't like to hear it either. I want to do it over and over and over until I get better at it. Because, you know, when you, when you start learning something, it's kind of fun. Can you all picture the time when you were learning to do something and it was kind of fun? And then it gets to the place where it's not fun. It gets hard. But that's when you get better. And if you, if you give up on it, then you never have a chance. So you probably are familiar with Thomas Edison, uh, his famous quote that was that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. You just work hard at it. So if one person is brilliantly gifted but they don't do, they don't work at it. They're not gonna do anything with it. And someone else could be kind of mediocre, but they really, really work at it, and they do amazing things because they work at it. Just because you're first, or second, or third, or fifth, or how many bulbs did Edison try? How many filaments, a hundred plus? Because your hundredth time didn't work? Try it again. All right, I'm sorry, that's my, mom teacher pep talk for everybody this morning oh yes 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 I've seen that cool runnings yes because they wanted to and because they found a way and they practiced very good yeah but they live in a place with no snow they live in Jamaica yeah I don't remember what, I saw this movie years ago. I don't remember uh, if they went to places to practice, but everybody laughed. Like, no, you can't have a bobsled team. You're in you're Jamaica. You're, you're, anyway, where there's a will, there's a way, as they say. Um, so I did not bring in um, uh, Chimabui's protege, Joto. He's the um, St. Francis feeding the birds and I brought it in previously. But then she goes on to mention Fra Angelico. Fra means brother. In case you wonder, Fra is not his first name. Yeah, uh, Frater, exactly. I have other Latin today too. Because I, I had forgotten about the whole Latin thing. I don't, is that still going on? Are you still collecting Latin? Okay. Um, and so he was a monk who was also a brilliant artist. And it says, we are told that Fra Angelico prayed as he worked, and everything that he painted shows a spirit of loving reverence and a care for every detail. Do you ever, did it ever occur to you to pray before you work? Like pray before you do your schoolwork? It sounds, I don't know, does it sound silly? But it says, in the Bible that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives freely. I'm not saying he's gonna tell you all the math answers telepathically. There's also work involved. Um, one of the, I brought two Fra Angelico. Um, and this one I might let you pass around, but some table, one table had this. This is the adoration. 
somebody had this when we looked at art last week, because I'm pretty sure I brought this one in. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to take the time. Go ahead and maybe you can just sort of look at it together, group yourself together just to spare time. Um, and then this is another, while you're waiting for that, this is another one. I think everybody can see this pretty well. Put up. Of Mary. Again, notice our colors, those, those code colors, red for sorrow or martyrdom, blue for royalty. We have angels in the corner. And notice how we're getting much more realistic. Look at the folds on Mary's robe. Fra Angelico, who prayed over his work. So go ahead, go ahead and pass it around. Keep in mind, when you look at that adoration, keep in mind the, if you can, the position of the people. Where Mary is, we have Mary like this, baby on her lap, over here is one of the wise men bowing down on his knees and the others behind. You're going to see that again. There were standard setups of the Holy Family, standard setups of the figures that people used over and over again when they, um, when they painted a certain scene. All right. Botticelli. Dorothy Mills says his chief aim was beauty. He was not telling a story like Giotto or offering his work as an act of devotion like Fra Angelico, but he was striving to attain sheer beauty of form and line. For Fra Angelico, this is a religious activity, painting this. For Botticelli, he's just purely interested in beauty and there's probably a couple of Botticelli paintings that you're familiar with. When I hold them up, you might say, oh, I know that picture. I just didn't know who did it. I'm not going to pass these around, but hopefully they're big enough for people to see. First of all, one thing that started happening by the time, oh, we're going to say as we get towards the year 1500, okay, in the late 1400s. Did you notice that every picture that I've been showing you has something to do with religion? Like it's a saint, or it's the Holy Family, it's a picture, uh, you know, a story from the Bible. We have not seen portraits of people. Sit for your portrait. These are portraits. Uh, this guy seems a little shifty to me. I don't know. I don't, I'm worried about him. This I like this guy's very, like, he seems nice. You seem shifty. I shouldn't really be judging. These are noblemen that set for a portrait. This is brand new. You, do you remember the very first, I guess it was the last chapter of the former Dorothy Mills book, Before Christmas, and then the beginning of this semester, we talked about individuals becoming more important in the Renaissance. We, we don't care so much about being a corporate part of a group, but individuals. What's more individual than having your portrait painted? The guy on the next page is a Medici. He is Giuliano de Medici, and he looks snooty. Does he not look snooty? Also, he has an enormous nose. I'm so sorry that he has an enormous nose, but... Here, I'll, how about if you want me to walk around? Here, it'll save time if I walk around, except I'm tethered. Here, just a second. What has happened? There we go. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. It looks like the zipper's in the front or something, except it wasn't a zipper. This is one of the Medici. <laughs> I think he's he's the looking down his nose at the commoners. I feel like. 
Why is there a bird? Don't know. It is, sometimes I'm guessing that if I did some research, I would find out it's code and it has something to do with the Medici family. <laughs> Somebody said it was Gaston yesterday. Might be Gaston. Yeah, probably the same attitude. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think that his clothes are probably on the right way, even though it appears to us that they're not. Um, <laughs> I, or vice versa, obviously, you know, because this guy came first. Um, a, this one is called Primavera. It is a celebration of spring. This is one that I thought maybe you might have seen before. In the, in the center, we have representations of spring and flowers, and we have the three graces dancing. And over here, we have some nasty like woodland satyr stealing away one of the nymphs because she's just out of luck. What, where are the graces and flora and satyrs and fauns from? Where do those stories come from? We say it aloud. Greek mythology. Do you remember we talked about that the Renaissance is a time that we're, we're going to start celebrating Greece and Rome? This has nothing to do with the nativity and the adoration. Brand new subjects in art. Look at this one, Primavera. If you, and guys, if you ever um, want to know the name of a painting, which, what is that picture you showed me? Because I want to look it up online. I'll let you know. Okay. No, they're just, their clothes are flowing. Their the empire waste kind of does that. No, they're not pregnant. <laughs> they just have, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let me grab. Oh, where is that? I can't. What? Um, it was at a, a library book sale for a dollar. I sing the praises of library book sales. So this is, um, so I, don't, don't worry about the bottom one, but I can't really fold it. This is his adoration, and this is Fra Angelico's. And I just, remember I told you, look at the way the people are positioned? Botticelli is not changing everything up. Oh, what's going on? Hold on. Oh, oh don't, don't, don't worry. Oh, so you can't. There we go. <laughs> I, I, I just want to talk to Okay, I know. They're positioned the same. Um, this is maybe the last one I'm going to come around, because I know, because we have time constraints. But I like people to see. Do you see how Mary is positioned the same? And the wise man is, is the same. <laughs> it's, it's a... <laughs> so, but do you see how the people are positioned the same? They use the same. So we have Mary. Yeah, yeah, the kind of... In the same places. Here, I'm sorry, Bailey. I gotta go around. No. No, I didn't say close together. I said, look, look. Mary's the same direction. The wise man kneeling. You see how they're the same, in the same positions. There's so many royals. Well, they are because they're the kings. They're the kings. No, you can't. <laughs> you can see it later if you want to. All right. Last, last one. All right. I'm not going to come around and, just because we're going to run out of time, obviously. So I hope you can see this is a picture. Well, you tell me what's happening in this picture. They're taking the body of Jesus off the cross. And Mary is weeping, and the other Mary is probably there at his, can't remember, at his head, there's one at his feet. Mary, his we mother, is holding him. Yeah, because there's a lot of Marys, you know. I mean, they're just, <laughs> sorry, but there's a lot of Marys. This is 
This form of painting, sorry, just a second, is called a paeta. And it comes um, from um, a Latin word, paetas. <laughs> it's almost, it's like sort of I'm teaching a class and sort of I'm just jerking him around seeing how fast I can get him to get, and then taunting him with pictures that I don't let them see. Okay, and it means, um, Pietas is what we call piety, but it means more duty. To the Romans, it meant more duty. You do your duty. But by, can you kind of see this? I, did I write this too small? The blue marker stinks, doesn't it? I hate the blue marker. Okay, we're going with the brown. Well, it's not doing the job. Uh, so a pieta is a picture of um, them showing reverence for Jesus' body. And this is, you can't see it, here, pietas, <laughs> it means duty or reverence or piety. Keep it in mind, because we're going to see a very famous paeta here in a few minutes, all right? No, I brought it to you. Um, okay, so let me zip through some of our other artists here. Okay, we did for Angelico, we did for Bowie. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, I think gets mentioned next in your book. The marvelous and divine Leonardo would have made great profit in learning had he not been so capricious and fickle. What does capricious and fickle mean? No? What are you if you're capricious? This is a good discussion. Anybody? Back table? Capricious? You change your mind all the time. You do this, then you do that, and you just can't focus. Fickle means something similar. He began to learn many things and then gave them up. Leonardo da Vinci is probably one of the most brilliant people who ever lived. How much, have you guys did a, done a study of Leonardo da Vinci? I know there was a like Da Vinci Machines exhibit in Galesburg or Muscatine or I, a friend of mine took her kids. Leonardo da Vinci was a scientist, and he was an artist, and he was an architect, and he was a philosopher, and he was a visionary, but he just couldn't pick one. Oh, he was one. Yes, 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 Rhett. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. You know, if it was he got bored with it, then the problem is what we were talking about before, that tenacity where you follow through. And some people lack that. But he was good at everything he did. It's not like he gave up on things because he stunk at it. I think he just had an enormous mind and an enormous desire to do everything. Do you, do you ever... Do you ever have many things you want to do, but you have to choose one? Like, well, we had four kids, and, and I had four kids, and so just because of expense and time, I told everybody they could pick one activity. I can't run people to multiple activities when I got four, you know what I mean? You pick one, and, and you're doing that. But then it's, it's hard sometimes if you have a lot of things you want to do. And I think he was like that. Unfortunately, we'll talk about this in a minute, he liked to experiment at critical times when it was a problem and he shouldn't be experimenting. We're actually going to talk about him more later in this book, I believe, as a, as a scientist. He was one of the first people that did studies of cadavers, he dissected dead bodies, so he could find out what it's like inside. 
which as we know, I mean, it's, it's kind of yucky, but all medical students do it. Because you need to find out what's inside there. If you're gonna operate on it, you need to find out what's inside and how it works. Oh. I'm, I'll have to ask my dental hygienist if she had to do that. He, he built a flying machine. But we know him largely because of his art. And of course, the most famous piece of art is what? From Leonardo da Vinci. What? The most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. It says, this is in Vasari again, for Francesco del Giocondo, Leonardo undertook the portrait of Mona Lisa, his wife, not da Vinci's wife, the Francesco del Giocondo's wife. No. This were, oh, Mona Lisa was very beautiful. And while Leonardo was drawing her portrait, he engaged people to play and sing and gestures to keep her merry and remove that melancholy which painting usually gives to portraits. This figure of Leonardo's has such a pleasant smile that it seemed rather divine than human and was considered marvelous, an exact copy of nature. Well, it would be hard to... Sure, this one is important enough we can pass it around. I feel like it wouldn't be that hard though because... Go ahead. It's like she's like smiling for like, oh, I don't remember, but I did see it. She never, she never smiled. <laughs> But we're not going to worry about what Mr. Peabody movie said. That's what Vasari says, that he employed, he employed gestures. I love the way people are so, they're so interested in detail when you, I don't know. I think it's probably a little, um, they call them fillets, you know, like a crown, uh, like a, it's like a, a jewelry headband that were popular in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Her name, Lisa, her name is Mona Lisa. Like Mona Lisa or the No, Mona Lisa Jocon del Jocondo because of her husband. Okay. So her full name, or like her first name was Mona Lisa. You know, my grandma, her first name was Mary and her middle name was Ruth, but everybody called her Mary Ruth because there were other Marys. So maybe her first name is Mona. I, I don't know. You ask me questions that I don't know. Yes, Rhett. He, yes, he made the background, which is very weirdly hazy, kind of creepy. Yes. Yes. Which. Mm. Oh, yes. Which, no, when you're, when you're done, pass it on. It, you know, things in the distance get hazy. If you look into the distance, far, far into the distance, it gets hazy, and so maybe we're looking way into the distance. When you're done with it, give it to the next table. Um, I hate to rush through. I, I wish we had like two hours just to stare at each one, but we don't. Uh, so I brought in some other da Vinci. This I'm not passing around. This is another one of his portraits. Her name is Ginevra da Vinci. No, not Da Vinci, oh. Da Vinci. Oh. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he was married. I don't know if anyone would want to be married to somebody yeah. like that, frankly. No, it's a tree behind her. It is not all her hair. What? She's dead now. <laughs> no, are you asking because she's so pale? Okay, so this is a good thing. So we think tans make you look healthy, except that we know it causes skin cancer and nobody, nobody slathers themselves in baby oil like we did in the 1970s and <laughs> fried yourself. We think that's a bad idea. Um, but in general, we think that if you have a little bit of a tan, it makes you look healthy. They thought it made you look low class. 
because it meant you had to work out in the sun. You didn't have people to do that for you. The paler you were, the, the, the more beautiful they thought your skin, and the more respectedly upper class you were. Does that make sense? So we like, oh man, she needs to get outdoors more. But they would have said, ah, that porcelain skin, that, that pale, that's what we want in a woman. <laughs> She's in the shade. <laughs> you know, it's funny how what we think is beautiful changes over time. If you look at art over time, you find out that what was considered beauty in one time is considered not in another time. It just changes. Yes, ma'am. I think she's actually wearing a veil for sort of thing because here. Maybe. I'll have, I'll have to look into that. I didn't think so, but I don't, I'm not going to definitively say. So I brought in a couple of other pictures, also library book sale. Um, this is, and I'm not, I'm not going to pass this around, okay? This is a picture, I should put it down, um, of Mary and Jesus and St. Anne, St. Anne, Mary's mother. Um, and this is, and, and Jesus is here and he's, He's kind of chasing after a lamb, which is significant, obviously. And this is a very confusing picture because Mary is sort of sitting, like Anne is behind, and Mary is stepping over Anne to, so to reach, yeah, kind of sitting on her lap. And, but notice the, remember I talked about how the way they arrange figures, draws your eyes. And notice how your eyes start at Anne and it leads you all the way to Jesus. They never, the artists never arrange things just willy-nilly. Oh, yes, because it's got the stages. Again, look at the background, if you can see the background. You know, that hazy, that hazy sort of background? Yeah, Rhett. Yes. Um, not, not Jewish art because the Jews were not allowed to represent creatures. It was against, it was against the, their religion to, so, I mean, we have Greek art, which would be significant and, and gorgeous. And in that rediscovery of that art is what spurred the Renaissance but not, not in Jesus's area. Sometimes if there's any art at all, it would be um, to think of designs. Do you know what I mean? Not, yes, that sort of thing. But, and, and Islamic art also, uh, uh, Muslims do not represent c creatures in art. But after Jesus, then when Jesus came and took a body, he, he, he made creatures holy. He, he, everything he touched, he made it holy. You know, it's like when we step in water, we make the water dirty because we wash ourselves off. He steps in water and he makes it holy. He makes it part of him. And so everything he touched, all the creatures, us, he made it holy. So we represent them now. But that's a good question. Um, this is probably the other most famous thing. And I, I'm sorry, I'm not, it wouldn't help me to pass this around, but this is the Last Supper. And, and you've probably, I'm sure you've seen representations of it. You know, this was painted in the dining room of a monastery. So it's like when the monks came and sat down to eat, this was a, another room opening off and Jesus was there having the last supper, which is awesome. But you probably have noticed in this one, you can see how it's very dingy looking. And when you see, you know, if you look online, they're always dingy looking. Here, this is exhibit A of Leonardo da Vinci wants to experiment with things. And what he did was, you know, we've talked about frescoes before, I believe. You put wet plaster on the wall and you paint on the wet plaster and the paint soaks into the plaster as the plaster dries. And it makes these vivid colors and the Greeks did this and the Romans. And he said, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna do plaster, we're gonna do a dry fresco. We're gonna paint it on the dry. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Da Vinci, it flakes off. It doesn't work. 
And so almost as soon as he was done painting it, bits started falling off, which is so sad. It's brilliant. He never really totally finished it. Some of the, some of the areas are just sort of sketched in, you know, with paint. The details aren't put in because it just almost started falling apart as soon as he did it. This was not a good time to experiment, unfortunately. But I guess if you start something, you don't know it's going to be a masterpiece of the world and that you shouldn't experiment. But I feel like maybe he should have done this at home with something first before he got paid to do it somewhere else. So th this has been a race against Leonardo da Vinci's experimentation to try to keep this painting together and try to keep it something we can look at, which is a shame. Um, there's, I didn't bring the picture in, but once he was, he was employed to do a whole wall, like not this tall, obviously, but it was a whole wall. It, it was a big wall, a mural of a war scene. All right, so he decides to make a new paint. He decides to, because artists then mix their own paints. He decided to use some sort of oil-based paint of his own devising, and it wouldn't dry. So he hung lamps in front of it so the heat would, and it made it kind of drip and melt. Again, practice this at home. I hate to be, you know, telling Leonardo da Vinci what to do, but I feel like maybe he did need a wife. Um, oh, and this is the lady with an ermine that I told you I had my daughter uh, copy years ago. Her, this is, this is unfortunate. This is the the man who employed Leonardo da Vinci to do this. This was his his girlfriend, and her name sounds like the Italian word for ermine. So it's a joke on her name that he put this in there, which is kind of fun. Anyway. No, this is the girlfriend of the guy who employed him. Not the guy, he said, Mr. Da Vinci, please paint a picture of my girlfriend. Do you understand? Does this make sense? I, do, I, have no, I have no knowledge about Leonardo da Vinci's romantic inclinations whatsoever. Girlfriends, I don't know. Um, all right, so I do not have a picture of Brunelleschi's dome in Florence. But I just challenge you and parents, I should put that in the email, Brunelleschi's Dome. Um, because there were, there were fabulous architects as well. And then um, I'm going to talk about the reformer preacher, Savonarola, here in a minute. But uh, Dorothy Mills goes on to talk about some of the artists in Rome, which brings me to the last few that I want to show you. Um, oh, my goodness, we are. Time's a wasted. The first one is Raphael. Raphael painted the most beautiful, beautiful things. And we have a good two examples. One, a religious subject. So you can see. This is, will you tell me who is this? It's Mary. And who else? Why do you think that? Because he's wearing the goat skin. It's John the Baptist and Jesus. Remember, they are cousins. They are cousins only six months apart in age. And so John is, and notice what's in the background. Can you see? Mountains and a river. John is going to be out by the River Jordan. He's going to be, that's going to be his calling. And I don't know if you can see it, but Jesus is holding a stick, but it's got a cross beam. Jesus is holding a little cross. They both, both of their callings in their future are in this painting. While Mary looks on with her, what colors? Pink, I know, red, pink and red, and blue, her royalty. This is Raphael. Yeah, red. Right. 
They usually sketched it out before. We have a lot of Leonardo da Vinci's sketches because he didn't finish them, you know, because he, then he had to go invent a flying machine or, you know, make paint that was going to flake off the wall or whatever. I'm sorry. Man's brilliant, but it just makes me, oh, if you had finished that, well, that would have been awesome. But the things he did finish for us are pretty awesome. But no, we have a lot of his sketches. And so you would lay out, you would take your, um, they started using canvas, but early on they would use a panel of wood, just a piece of wood, and, and then sketch on it. I want where the heads are gonna be. We have another one of these nice diagonal don't we? Um, and, and in a sense, I guess the whole thing is triangular. Shape was really important to them. Raphael, so he does a religious subject. And then this is going to be hard for you guys back there to see. Um, this is maybe one of his most famous paintings. It's called School of Athens. And in the middle, we have Plato and Aristotle. And surrounding them are notable Greek philosophers, writers, historians. This is really a celebration of, there, um, of the Greek world. School of Athens by Raphael. Every time you take a ancient history class, they show you this picture. I show it too, because it's interesting. In, in this little moment, each of these figures is telling you something about his philosophy. Plato has his finger like this. And it's not just because Raphael thought that'd be a cool pose. Plato taught that up above there were forms of everything that are, that are here. And those were the things that mattered. Those were the real things. And all these things we can see and touch, they're not important. I look to the forms. And Aristotle's on this side, and he has his hand like this. Because he's saying, no, it's, it's the individuals. It's the particulars that we study. That's what matters. And so they're, they're telling you their philosophy what, with the way they put their hands. Anyway, I have looked up, I can't ever remember but I've looked up online. You can find people naming who they think the different personages are. Some of them we don't know. That's Raphael. So a mix, right? Our Greek and Roman heritage that they're rediscovering during the Renaissance, but still religious themes as well. And then we have Michelangelo. And I promised you that I would bring in, or show you, another Pieta. This, Michelangelo was an architect. He built, he designed parts of St. Peter's and then painted the Sistine Chapel. He can design it and decorate it. And, th and then makes statuary to put in it. Is that everything? <laughs> We couldn't afford it. It <laughs> was selling. This, this is a piece of marble. I know. And every time I say that, and every time, I hope, I'm hoping someday I get to go to Italy. There's my hope. My son who took me to Greece doesn't want to go to Italy. I know. I think I'm, I've got my husband almost <laughs> sucked in. Anyway, I'm working on it. Uh, because it looks like it should give to the touch. It's so real. The folds of her robe. But this is, I erased it, this is a Pieta. This is Mary mourning her dead son. And the fact that you can see all of, look at Jesus' arm. You can see the veins and the muscles. It's a piece of marble. How do you do that? I don't know. Yes, Rhett. This is a picture of a statue. Yes, this is a, this is a picture of a statue. He said 
that he could see the figure in a block of marble and he just took away the pieces that didn't belong. That must be nice to have such a vision. Anyway, I, it's, it's stunning. I mean, is, if this is the only thing this man ever did, he would be in our history books as one of the greatest artists who ever lived. But this is not the only thing he did. Um, that I don't know. And I also don't know, somebody asked me yesterday, how long did it take to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling? I do not know that, years. Uh, I know, um, I'm not, this is, because we're running out of time, I'm not gonna come around. Uh, I couldn't find a good picture uh, of the whole ceiling to bring in. And of course, there is no good picture of the whole ceiling because you can't see the individual paintings. But I'm sure you all know the story. He was hired to do the ceiling. He didn't really want to do it, but he did it. But so he has to spin. You know, the ceiling is not, it's high. It's not just an eight foot ceiling. He can't just get a ladder. It's way up there. And he's got to have scaffolding and he's painting on a ceiling. So he, he has to lie down. He has to lay on the scaffolding. I only add sides. It would make it would be it would be a nervous thing for me. But but can you imagine? And so the Pope kept coming in and saying, "When's it going to be done?" And apparently, this was. I mean, it's not a good thing to ask most people, honestly, if they're working intensely on something. When are you going to be done? It's not, it's not helpful. But it really wasn't helpful, his personality. And so the story goes that one day he accidentally dropped something off his scaffolding, about hit the Pope on the head. That was the answer to when are you going to be done? Leave me alone. Brett, you had a question or a comment? No, okay. Um, so, but the famous portions of it, you probably have seen, oh, I'm losing pages. Um, the creation of Adam. Probably everybody has seen this. We have God, God the Father here reaching across with that spark of what makes Adam a human being, that what makes him created in God's image, and he is imparting that. However, we do not only have a religious scene on the ceiling. I just lost my mic. There are also the Sibyls, the Roman prophetesses. And you might say, well, that's very strange. Why would he? That's a pagan thing. Here's why. Because the church fathers, when they were looking at pagan literature and, and pagan stories, they realized that there were things said by the pagans and prophecies that actually were on the mark. The pagans didn't know they were speaking the truth, but they were. And the church fathers said, you know what? All truth is God's truth. And pagans and non-believers can speak the truth. God can use them. They might not know they're speaking the truth. Just like the high priest who said it is better that one man die for the people than that all the people should perish. Talking about Jesus. He did not realize what he was saying. One man was going to die for all the people. It had a significance he didn't understand. So he included um, the Sibyls. And here is a close up of, um, oh, I can't remember. I think it's Elijah. Don't hold me to that. But the prophets on. And of course, when we see it very, very close up, it's, you can see the cracks, the cracks in the ceiling. But can you imagine can you imagine laying on your back and painting and painting and painting and painting and making something? It, it reminds me of sort of like the, the Impressionists, if you know what I mean, that when you're farther away from it, it, it makes a clearer picture than when you're very, very close to it like this. The Pope at the time was Julius II, and he also asked Michelangelo, would you please design a bunch of statues for my tomb? And 
Uh, this is, it never got finished. But he did design one statue, and it's very odd. Uh, she, and actually, she, Dorothy Mills mentions it. It's a statue of Moses. I'm sorry, I'm very tangled up today. It's, it's my extension cords getting me. And this is his statue of Moses that was meant to be on um, the Pope's tomb. And the, the very strange thing, again, we, we see the, the drapery, it's very lifelike, but he's got horns. He, he's got horns. Did he have horns? Do you know why he has horns? Here's why he has horns. Because the, the translation of the Old Testament that they were using, the word for the glory of God shown from Moses' face was very much like the word for horns. So someone asked me yesterday, did they think he literally grew horns in the Old Testament? I don't know. Or if they knew the difference and they put the horns there symbolically to show the glory, I, I don't know. But it was a mix-up between the word for glory, that, that, that glory that shone from his face every time he went in to talk to God. And he had to veil his face and, and the word for horns. So when you see a, picture, a painting, a statue of Moses with horns, just think glory. But it's weird to see a statue with horns. It kind of looks like a pagan god. Yes. Yeah, Rhett. You would think so. Um, I, and I think, I don't think Michelangelo was suffering for, for money. Um, especially because his employers were quite wealthy. The church was very wealthy. Yes. Artists, obviously, though, producing art takes time. And so there's only a certain amount of, of pieces of art you can produce and sell. Or if I'm commissioning you to paint a portrait of my daughter or my dog or whatever, it's going to take you a while. So in, in the Renaissance, artists had patrons. They had a, um, uh, a guard. This is a Latin word, too. And you, you Harry Potter fans... Patronus. This is where the word patron comes from. It's a guardian or prote protector. It's the Latin word for guardian or protector. And so they had a patron, um, someone wealthy who would sponsor them and support them. Give them room and board, whatever they needed to produce the art they were going to produce. Um, because we know being an artist today, you know, being an artist is a hard road. You know, it's hard to make enough money to support yourself as an artist. And, you know, if you're not going to be, if you're going to spend three months on a piece of art or more, you're not going to get paid till it's done. So who's going to take care of you and who's going to feed you in the meantime? So wealthy people would take on an artist and help them. But then, you know, if you, if you have the right clients, you could do quite well. Right, I think, I think I showed you everything I brought in. Uh, this is a whirlwind look. If any of these people intrigue you, go to the library and just get a get a book of of paintings and just look at them. You don't have to do a study of their life unless you really get into them. But just just take a look at them and, and um, spend some time with them. Yeah, Jesse. Oh, it means a guardian, a guardian or a protector. Was that your question too, Isabella? They were famous during their lifetimes. We often, we often do think of people in the past, oh, they were unknown at the time. These, these people were known and sought after. He said, Raphael, I'm pretty sure, is the one who was apprenticed and did the magnificent angel that caught everybody's attention and thought that this guy's brilliant. So no, they were really sought after. This was a, a climate, an atmosphere where art was really valued. You know, we don't, well, this lets me, this kind of gives my opinion a little bit, but a lot of art today is kind of, <laughs> you 
you know. I mean, it's just not, doesn't impress. Yeah, and we, we just don't, it doesn't have the reputation that it had then. The art world was the world to be in. It wasn't just for the elite. It was, it was a celebration of beauty. And you also didn't have to have special training to understand what all the, the dots on the canvas were supposed to represent. You knew what it was. It's Saint Anne and Mary. You, you knew what it was and you knew what it meant. And I think it made people feel closer to it. Yeah, Rhett. Yes. 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 Sometimes because they were too busy. And then if you get enough, if you make a name for yourself, you're, you have the power to say, that is not a project that interest, interests me. Oh yeah, they did. And then of course, poor Mr. Da Vinci, because he was just distracted. <laughs> well, you know, maybe he just didn't say no enough. Maybe that was his problem. Yeah, I'll do that, but I won't finish it. Okay. Um, but like, like I was saying, if, if any of these interest you, intrigue you, the library is full of big hardback books, just full of pictures. And just spend an afternoon, make a cup of cocoa or your winter treat of choice and sit down and just spend an hour or two with some beautiful paintings and just let yourself dive into them, and, uh, which is much more than we can do, we have time to do here, okay? Let's look at your questions now. At the same time that all this is going on, all these artists are painting, we also have tremendous problems politically. Last week we talked about Florence and all these Italian city-states, do you remember? They're fighting each other all the time. They're throwing people out and letting other ones come back. Poor Dante goes on a trip and they just say, yeah, our side wins, you're exiled now. Don't come home or we'll kill you. That's going on. And a lot of immorality, corruption. Remember we read Machiavelli last week. You know, you just need to do what you need to do. And if you take over, do all the evil you have to do in one fell swoop, right? You gotta bump some people off, bump them all off at once. This was not the sort of thing that people would have said 500 years earlier. They would have said, it is a mortal sin to go bumping people off, don't do it. Machiavelli says, yeah, sometimes you gotta. That's what's going on. So we have this guy, Savonarola. What is his message? This was the first question I asked you, Lauren. Yes. There, does anybody have something they want to add to that? Yeah, Ella. Okay, yes. People are living in luxury in Italy. They are surrounded by these beautiful works of art. And they, Venice, here, is the hub of the shipping world of Europe, right? Goods come from uh, China, from the Indies, silk and spices and tea, all these cinnamon, cinnamon. Do anybody love cinnamon? With some sugar, pepper, all these things. They bring them in. Maybe, maybe they take a pit stop at Constantinople. They ship them in to Venice, and Venice is the hub that sends them out to the rest of Europe. They were incredibly wealthy. Because as you know, you can buy stuff cheap and then sell it for more, you know, and then you get to keep the extra money, right? And that's what they did. So people were very wealthy. And Dorothy Mills tells us, he looked with dismay at the luxury and materialism that great wealth had brought to Florence. He began to preach and soon his sermons were famous. I wanna read this. This is an account of people coming to hear this man preach. 
And I just want you to listen and ask yourself the last time you went to this much trouble to go hear a sermon. I have never. I'll just start this out by saying I've never gone to this much trouble to go hear a sermon. There came always bands of people to hear the sermons, and from the rugged mountainsides there rode in the country people, and all night long they traveled to Florence, and that, so that in the morning when the door opened and a great crowd entered, all going straight to take their places. And there were not wanting rich citizens, full of charity, who had the goodness to give them food and drink and lodging. They took them into their houses, as many as 20 or 30 or 40 strangers at a time of those who had come to the sermon. They went out spontaneously and invited them, competing with one another to do so. They met them at the gate of the city, so that it seemed like the time of the primitive church. At the door of the cathedral, the people, waiting till it should be open, made no account of any inconvenience, neither of the cold, nor of the wind, nor of standing in winter with their feet on the marble. Among them were old and young, women and children of every sort, who came with such joy and gladness that it was wonderful to hear them going to the sermon as to a wedding. Inside the church, the silence was great, each one going to his place. Those who could read with a taper in their hand, a taper is a candle, said the office, and, said, and others said other prayers. And though there were many thousands of people altogether, you would not even hear a hush until the arrival of the children who sang hymns with so, so much sweetness that heaven seemed to have opened. So they waited three or four hours till the father entered the pulpit. And the attention which you saw in this great mass of people was marvelous, all with eyes and ears intent on the preacher, without weariness, so that when the sermon was ended, it seemed to them it had scarcely begun. And this is his message, in season and out of season. Savonarola denounced the sins of the people and prophesied that God would send a scourge upon Italy and that only by fire would she be purified from her sin. When Charles VIII descended upon Italy with an army, he was looked upon as the fulfillment of Savonarola's prophecy and for a time the prior became the most important person in Florence. They came to hear that all the stuff that they had in their homes that make them live in luxury and divert them from God were sinful and they should get rid of them. It wasn't even a, a message, you're all wonderful. They didn't come to hear this message. They came to hear a message that maybe wasn't, you wouldn't think would be welcome. The people were so moved uh, that we hear there was great enthusiasm, and that year the carnival was kept in Florence. Uh, the carnival is like Mardi Gras, okay? So the day before Lent begins, the day before Ash Wednesday, people tend to live it up a little bit because for a good long time there are things you're not going to be able to eat. Yes, yes, and that's why it's fat because we are eating to our heart's content, eating and drinking and partying, because it, when Lent begins the next day, it will shut it down. So this is the same as Carnival. Okay, so there was great enthusiasm, and that year the Carnival was kept in Florence by the bonfire of the vanities. The followers of Savonarola had gone to every house in Florence, entreating all who had articles of luxury and vanity to give them up to be burned. They were taken to the piazza, and an immense bonfire made of them, all kinds of lovely stuffs, brocades and silks and tapestries, pictures and statues, musical instruments, and every kind of feminine adornment. Um, and I was just curious, do, do we, does God want us to burn all our nice things? Were they wrong to burn their nice things? <laughs> is it wrong to have things? Is it wrong to love the things? I mean, in a, in a, do you know what I mean? Like love, be devoted to the things. Should define my love. 
it, it's hard to keep them separate though, isn't it? We get attached. And maybe they were attached. Do, do you know what I mean? It's a hard question, isn't it? Yeah, Rhett, you say what you wanted to say and then I have something else to add. Mm. There's no indication that they forth that they took things away from people. Do you know what I mean? It sounds like it was all voluntary. It makes me think of when Jesus said that if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He, he did not literally mean that we should run around cutting our hands off. I don't believe he literally meant that. Or if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. But he did say drastic measures might be necessary. And um, I have a couple of boys I do a book discussion with and they were talking about the uh, one of them has a whole set of uh, Copleston's history of philosophy which I want to borrow from him anyway uh, and that he had had one volume and he didn't have many was visiting um, a Catholic priest that he knew and this priest had just bought this set and the, the young man that I know said oh you know I'd read and I, I'm really interested in those and the priest just said here and he gave him the whole multi-volume set that he just purchased for himself. And I relate to that because I love my books. Do you know, it's the things that we love the most, maybe it's good to be open-handed with. <laughs> Does that make sense? You know, just to practice. It's okay, I don't need to be too attached to this. This, this person isn't who I am. But that, anyway, I, you know, that's, that's not something I can decide for you, right? Or you can decide for me. But they decided that they were inordinately attached to living lives of luxury, which I think we can all admit, when we have lots of comfy stuff that, that make us happy and um, keep us comfortable and divert our attention, it's harder to say, I should go read my Bible or I should go pray. It just, it just, it, can we, do we all agree that this is true? Like when you're just, you're comfy and you're cozy and you're watching your favorite TV show or movie or playing your video game or whatever, that we get attached to those things. And, and in Florence, they were really attached to it. And so for whatever reason, whether it was emotional excitement or the Holy Spirit was working through him and said, you need to get rid of these things because they're blocking your relationship with me. They did it. The bonfire of the vanities has become a, a proverbial. And by the way, what, what does it mean for something to be, what does vain mean? It means different things. What? Okay, because sometimes it means, we, we use it to mean pride, right? If you're vain, you think well of yourself, you're inordinately pride. But this is kind of, uh, this kind of vain or vanity means it's, it's worthless. Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's, it, it doesn't mean anything, says the writer of Ecclesiastes. Okay, thank you for following me on that. Um, what happened to him? Did you, did you answer that part? Maybe you did, but I can't remember. Jesse? Yes. Yes. He was excommunicated and then executed. <laughs> Why? Lauren. Treason and heresy. Although, Dorothy Mills informs us, he never attacked the doctrine of the church. He's not, he's not Wycliffe, all right? He's not Martin Luther. He's not saying the church is doing it all wrong. He's saying, you people are living cushy, luxurious lives and you need to wake up. But he made, can we hold that thought for a minute? Until we go to the, the last question I asked you. 
what seemed to be the greatest preoccupation of 16th century popes? Somebody else. No offense. Anybody else want to answer? All right, I'm going to give it to Ella. Okay. Politics and art. Not so much God. This is a description we have in here of, of Pope Alexander VI. He was gifted with the most penetrating intelligence. He was clever, industrious, and eloquent. He was unequaled in the dexterity of his actions, in persuasiveness. He was so great a man that he would have been a great prince. And thought word indeed had his natural gifts been allowed to develop. Um, yet in spite of all his qualities, his reign cannot be called auspicious. All was dark as night. Never in the lands of the church were seditions more threatening, robberies more frequent, murders more cruel, the peace of the public highways more brutally disturbed, or the way of travelers more dangerous. Never was Rome in a more unhappy state. This was the situation. And you know what? When people, when people, when religious people speak out against the people in power, what often happens to them? Think John the Baptist. You can't have your brother's wife. And he stepped on toes. And his head ended up on a platter. This happens when you say things that people in power don't want to hear. And it happened to him. Yeah, Rhett. Yes, it was exactly a business. Getting to be the Pope was like getting elected to the, the cushiest office ever, where you could have anything you want, and you're controlling Italian politics, right? Do you remember the, the map I gave you last week? We have Naples down here, but we have all these Italian city-states, and then in the middle of Italy, here we have the Papal States. The Pope has become one of the rulers, an Italian ruler. And you know what? If one of the other people gets stronger, that means he gets weaker. And so he would, okay, so your Florence and your Venice and your Milan, and I don't remember which you are, you're Venice, you're getting strong. So maybe I come and I stir you up to go attack them. You see, just to keep you down. And then I get you down, but you guys are, are getting stronger. No, you guys are stronger now because you attack them. So now I'm going to come over to you and, and why don't you attack them? I'm going to cause trouble between. That's what they spent their time doing. And they didn't like to hear the message that they shouldn't be eating bonbons and laying on silk couches that they're the heirs of Peter, all right? Not the heirs of Persian kings. Other problem that he had was he dabbled in politics in Florence. He threw out that Medici family, our friend with the long nose and all his cohorts, and set up a republic in Florence. Some people, yay raw, but if you're the people who used to be in charge, how do you feel about that? No, we want to be in charge again. So hey, we'll join up with the Pope. He hates him too. And we'll get rid of him. And that's what they did. Kind of a sad story. But he lit a fire. You know, he made people start thinking, is this all there is to life? You know, all these riches are pouring into Italy and we're surrounded by these beautiful works of art. Is that all there is to life? Maybe not. Okay. The second question I asked you was, what happened to Venice after Constantinople fell? All right, I give this one to Lauren. Yeah, say it really loud, because the... Yes, no longer is Venice the queen, because the shipping road here is blocked. Now, they, they often would ship up to the Red Sea and, and you know, uh, uh, from the Indies. But trade 
roots shifted because this was in the hands of the Turks. And so trade started shuttling this way. Also, this is crazy because you've got to remember all this stuff is happening at the same time. What happened in 1492? Columbus went to America. Before him, we have Prince Henry the Navigator. Um, he was from Portugal. We're going to read about the explorers later in this book, but he's, he's from Portugal. And he had sent um, exploratory expeditions around Africa. Why? Because this route was getting blocked off. This whole area was eventually run by the Turks, and they need a new route. And it would be very, very convenient if we could figure a way to bring it around Africa. Now, we can still, we can still cut up here, and they did. But they explored, and they explored, and they explored until they went all the way around, and they have a new trade route. And guess what, Venice? You're not on the route anymore. Yeah, Brett. Well, you know what? They, they did. There was a, they were just an amazing fighting force. Um, but this didn't happen overnight. They, the, the Byzantine Empire was getting smaller and smaller and smaller for 100, 150 years. And, you know, this originally, it wasn't the Turks, but it was, uh, oh, it was inroads of the Turks, um, the Crusades, when they said, please come help us. And they sent to the, to the West, and they came and said, we will help you. And unfortunately, we will sack Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade. There was a, a huge sea battle at Lepanto, and I can't ever remember where Lepanto is. I feel like it's off this coast of Greece. And G.K. Chesterton wrote a, a really amazing poem about the Battle of Lepanto. And it was um, one of the great sea battles in history, and it was the West against Turkish fleet, and they beat them. They were beatable. But at this point, relationship, the, Rhett, the relationship between the East and the West had really broken down. You know, the churches, the church had been split in half for many, many years, and it was just so far away. Does that make sense? Like, oh, it's a lot of trouble to send people. You know, we did that during the Crusades, and we did it, and we did it, and it just didn't do any good. It didn't have any lasting value, and so maybe that's just something we shouldn't bother with. Does that make sense? Um, I think, okay, I'm grasping at numbers, but it, it was into the 1600s, the last incursion of the Turks, the Muslims, into Western Europe. As, as late as the 1500s, 1600s was the final battle. And it, and it was fought on September 11th. Interesting. The very last battle that threw them out of Europe. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm digressing. But we have, we have new ways to get stuff. Does that make sense? And then Magellan goes around the world. And so all this, this spate of exploration, that's happening at the same time. So we're not too upset that the route has closed because we can still get our tea and our silk and our cinnamon and our pepper. But sorry, Venice, you're not the hub of Europe anymore. Okay. Well, not so much that. It's that where do you go? Where do you go after that? This is all controlled by the enemy. Do you see what I mean? So, and and so we want to go over here. How are we going to get there? Because there used to be a, a it was called Silk Road, right? A, a well-traveled road from China where they brought all this stuff and they would, you know, maybe bring it around to Constantinople, um, easier than going overland. But if, if this is all enemy territory now, we just don't want to mess with that. 
There were pirates too. Um, North Africa was notorious for piracy. If you ever read the book Robinson Crusoe, you know about the guy who was shipwrecked on an island? You kind of know Robinson Crusoe? Um, at the beginning of the book, he gets captured by pirates off the coast of North Africa. And that was written in well into the 1600s. So it, it, it's hard. History is hard because all this stuff's going on at once, you know? And then why is this happening? Well, it's because something else is happening. So all these happened at the same time, though. And I don't know what, if one of them caused the other. Do you know what I mean? If Turks are taking over, so we're going to find a new route. Prince Henry, I erased him. He just seemed like a curious kind of guy. He never went out in the boats. He just sent people. They kept really good records of everything they found until they found out you could go around Africa. All right. I'm going to have you read chapter three next week. And we're going to take a look at, is it France? Uh, because remember I told you, uh, Dorothy Mills told us at the beginning that we have, the histories of these countries are starting to split apart in the Renaissance. And so to look at them, we sort of have to look at them individually. So that's our look at Italy. Would you just please take a few, take what you need and then pass them around to the other tables? I wanted to mention our friend Archie uh, in, in Freedom's Cause. But I would like to take an informal poll. You know, the nice thing about some of the things we read is they're negotiable. Could I just take a poll? How many of you are really enjoying this book? Okay. How many of you are finding this book kind of boring and stale? Please be honest. All right, but I feel like that table's distracted because I don't feel like you voted either way. Do you, okay, just gentlemen, just take one. Get one to Bailey. Bailey, do you have one? Okay. Raise them high. I really don't like this book. Raise it up. Okay. Compare it to uh, The Dragon and the Raven. Better, worse? It's better than The Dragon and the Raven? Oh, really? Expected that vote to go the other way. Uh, there's, some, there's some things we read that aren't negotiable. Uh, everybody's always going to read the Beowulf retelling, and you're going to read this Chaucer storybook, and it's just not negotiable. King Arthur, not negotiable. The Hinty books are negotiable, and he wrote a bajillion of them. So anyway, I, my, win my Tuesday kids just hate it. So I said I would ask you guys. Um, it hasn't been my favorite Hinty book I've ever read. I mean, I read it over the summer, you know, for the first time, and I thought, no, this will be fine, and we're not talking about Scotland, and this will be good. And now that I'm reading it again with you guys, I think, oh, no, this is really going on and on and on, and I wish it was at the end. Is it easier to read? Yeah. It's, it's got a lot of politics in it, right? The, and it depends on if you like that sort of thing. Yes. Okay. So there's spurts of activity and there's battles and then they pull back and... Yeah. Um, Interestingly, in, in, I, I had a couple things I wanted to mention here. Oh, I, can we just stop? So I collected your papers. Did anyone have any problem understanding how to do the paper you just gave to me? Does everyone feel like if I gave you another assignment like that, you're good? Any, any question? Any que there's no question that's silly. Yes. Okay. So, so. Isabel is, just to be loud, because it's hard to hear in here, she said she had trouble finding a place to put her parallelism. So that's not so much a how to write the paper as, as working your way through the paper. Um, what was your? Okay, okay. 
So I'm, I'm, okay, so that's, and that's another thing. But once you have the information, we all understand the form of the paper. We have five paragraphs, right? You don't have to write this down because you already have. We have an introduction and a conclusion. And then we have three body paragraphs that give reasons for your position. And we're all good on that. We all understand that. I thought, because I've made you do a lot of writing about sometimes things that aren't very interesting to you, this is going to be, <clears throat> I'm choosing the topic, but it's a little bit of a freebie and a fun one. I want you to write why I love winter or why I hate winter. That, that, that's it. That, that's your paper. Just, just to take a little break from, from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Yes, right. Yes, so what you will need to do, and we're spending two weeks on this paper. That is not code for I don't do anything this week and I wait till the next week. I feel like I need to say this every time. So this week, your goal would be to think of three reasons. And then for each of those three reasons, try to think of three explanatory reasons. Rhett, what is your question? Well, I would like a, different methods work for different people, but often once we write the body, we know what we've written, and then it's easier to say, this is what I'm going to write, because I already wrote it. However, I'm not, this is, it's not illegal for you to do it the other way. Do you know what I mean? And honestly, when I write something personally, I tend to just write in order and not do it this way, but the idea is that this will make that easier for you. But if you don't find it easier, it, it's fine. So just to remind you, when we choose our reasons, we need them to be bigger. Remember my umbrella? Bigger reasons that we can fill in. For example, I like winter because I enjoy winter sports. See, then you can talk about winter sports. Well, what kind of sports do you like? What do they include? Do you have to travel to do these sports? Do you enjoy the travel? Do you see how now I have something to say about winter sports? But if I say something very specific, I love winter because hot chocolate is delicious. That's a very narrow reason, you know? And now I've got to write a whole paragraph on hot chocolate. And I suppose you could do the history of marshmallows or something. But it's easier to do a larger topic. I hate winter because of bad weather. Well, now tell me about the bad weather. What does bad weather cause? Well, you fall down on the ice and you break your leg and, you, and it causes delays and you have a wreck and then your car is in the shop. You can fill that in. That's a big reason. Okay, your goal is to find three. Yes, Isabella. You certainly could do a chart, a pros and cons chart to brainstorm. Like these are reasons I like it, these are reasons I hate it. Because if you don't just have a gut reaction, I feel like I hate it, I know I hate it, or I know I love it. If you're, if you're on the fence, then writing down all the good things about it and all the bad things about it and taking a look at that could be very helpful. Yeah, Bailey, yes. It's okay. If, it, if, it, if you get your thought together, you let me know later. later. Yeah, um, Alice. Say it loud, Alice. Winter. Winter. If you are having trouble, come to me next week. Or better yet, ask the whole, for the whole class to hear. If you're having a problem, other people may be having the same problem. Now I've used up our time, that's okay. I will say the things I wanted to say about Archie and William Wallace and Robert Bruce next week. I would like you to finish the book this week, all right? So if you're loving it, I'm sorry, it's almost over soon. If you're hating it, yay, it's almost over. 
Maybe we'll start something else. Um, maybe I'll have to rethink this one for two years from now. Um, but we'll, we'll save what I wanted to discuss for next time. Thank you. Always, if you have a question, if you start writing or working on it and you're not clear, call me, email me, and I will let you know, okay? You have two weeks for this paper. But start it this week, all right? All right, see you next week.